It's Sunday, May 8th, 2011, and you're watching This Week in Linux News. I'd like to start off by saying a happy Mother's Day to all of the mothers out there, specifically to my wife, who's the mother of our two-year-old son, and to my mother. Thank you so much for all that you do, mothers out there. We definitely appreciate it. But let's get on with the news. In distro release news, this week version 7.0 of the Zenwalk Live CD became available. We've talked about Zenwalk a couple of times before. It is basically Slackware with a graphical interface on top of it, a very easy to use package manager, and one app that's available for each different type of category. So if you've ever been interested in trying out Slackware but you didn't want to go through all of the setup process, or if you just wanted to try something out that was Slackware based, this may be a good time to give it a shot. You don't even have to install it on your system. In other release news, Ping iOS version 11.04's beta came out this week. If you recall, just a few months ago we talked about the previous release of Ping iOS, so there is a new one coming out based on 11.04. I believe they're using GNOME version 2.32 without the Unity front end on it. They're still making some changes, finalizing some things, so we should see where it goes here in the very near future. And even though it's not a release, let's talk a little bit about Linux Mint 11. This week, Clem released a little bit of information on when Linux Mint 11 is coming and a little bit of info on what's going to be included and what's not. They're expecting to put out a release candidate in the middle of May, and the final release should be out at the end of May. The desktop they're including by default is the one used in the previous version. It's GNOME 2.32 with the Mint menu on top of it. As far as software updates, it's pretty much got a lot of the same software updates and changes as Ubuntu 11.04 does. And from what I've read, there is already a preview version out, but I don't think there's a way for the general public to get it, so I haven't gotten my hands on it yet. Let's move on to some general Linux news. A few times in the past, I've mentioned that Adobe has expressed some interest, maybe, maybe not, about bringing their creative suite to Linux. I believe it was just last week I talked about the Git Satisfaction page where you could go and express your interest in whether or not you want the creative suite on Linux. Well, Adobe employee Carrie Burgess, the one person we seem to be able to get in contact with at Adobe, has come back to the Git Satisfaction page and basically said, while it's on the engineer's radar, we have no interest in actually creating a product for Linux at this time. He says they do take these requests seriously and they will be evaluating it again in the future, but at the current moment they're not planning to make one right now. So what does that mean for us? It means basically we're going to keep using the open source software we know and love. Eventually, if Adobe decides that it is the right time, they will go ahead and make one for us, maybe. But things have worked very well for us so far and they will continue to do so. But things were not all downers in the Linux news this week. If you remember a few months back, we talked about how Sony was removing the other OS option from the PS3 and that hackers had very quickly brought it back. Then there was a huge lawsuit surrounding GeoHot and things got up and down and their site got hacked and the PlayStation Network went down. Well, PS3 hackers have now officially returned the other OS option to the PS3. So if you do still have your PS3 after all of this falling out with the PlayStation Network and you are interested in running Linux on it, go ahead and check out the firmware. I'll have a link to the Ars Technica article which links over to the Git Brew page. Basically it is a complicated process right now, but it is definitely doable if you're interested in running Linux on your PS3. In another bit of good Linux news, if you're not familiar with it, there's a project called Optimus created by NVIDIA. And basically what that is, they've got a relatively decent powered video card that is NVIDIA, and then they've got an Intel integrated backend that can switch seamlessly between one and the other, but only within Windows, as far as I know for the moment. Might also work in Mac, but it doesn't work on Linux. And according to NVIDIA, they have no plans to support it on Linux. Well, up to this point, there's been a community of hackers out there making it work using the VGA switcheroo call from the kernel and using a couple of other things. However, silently, behind the scenes, someone has been developing a way to make this work. In what he is calling Open Source Optimus, this is called Prime NG, and basically it's not a driver as such, it's just a way to offload some of the things from the Intel integrated graphics onto the NVIDIA graphics just when you need it. So by default, you'd be running the Intel graphics for your everyday applications, and when you come upon a game, for example, that would need 3D graphics and a little bit more power, you'd say OptiRun64 and then the name of the app. It would call up the NVIDIA processor to go ahead and take care of the game itself and let the Intel run in the background. The one problem with this, of course, is the NVIDIA card has to be running all the time to make it work, which means your battery will be eaten just a little bit more. But if you do want that power to be called up at any given time, you do kind of need to leave it running, at least for the time being. I will say, though, it is awesome to see the open source community taking over and doing something that NVIDIA themselves have refused to do. 
Moving on to one little bit of Ubuntu news. This week, if you didn't realize it, was Ubuntu Open Week. As a part of Ubuntu Open Week, Mark Shuttleworth did a one-hour question and answer session in the Ubuntu Classroom IRC channel on irc.freenode.net. Basically, the majority of the questions that he received were related to Unity and how he thinks that it's working out and his opinion on this, that, and the other, mainly sort of surrounding Unity. And the responses he gave were those responses you would expect to hear. It's very, very early in the development process. This is not a long-term support release, so we were comfortable releasing this as it is. Yes, I'm happy with it, but it's not going to stay this way forever. We're going to keep growing it and changing it. And basically, he was just throwing out there that it's still very early. There's still a lot that's going to be done, so really don't worry about it. If you like it, wonderful. If you don't like it, you might like it in the future. However, there were two things in there that I was a little bit confused about, some of the last questions asked to him. One of the two questions was Android or iPhone, and his response was iPhone. As a previous iPhone owner, I can't really fault him there. I did enjoy my iPhone while I had it. However, after having owned the Android-based device for several months now, I definitely enjoy the customizability, the ability to use widgets, so I can't say that I completely agree there, but I will not fault him for using Apple products. And the last question they asked him is, is Ubuntu profitable yet? And if not, when will it be? And in a surprising answer, because I thought it was, he says, no, it's not profitable. But while their projections are confident, meaning hopefully they will be making profits at some point, there are reasons for them to be pushing forward faster than it would grow organically. Not sure what all of that means. I'm not really a marketing person, but from what I can gather from it, it just means that they're throwing more money at it than they're making out of it. Hopefully they will continue to see growth. And the last thing I'd like to talk about today, one little bit of Android news. Sorry things are kind of short this week, I'm in a hurry to get back upstairs and spend some time with my wife. But basically, the rumor mill has been circulating quite a bit this week that Verizon has already signed off on the release of Gingerbread for the Droid X. You heard it right, there have been several different leaks just this week for versions of Gingerbread containing new versions of Blur. I'm actually running the .591 version myself and I'm about to update to the absolute latest and greatest, which I think is a .001 change from the final one. So if all goes well and you're running the stock firmware or if you're running a non-rooted version of one of the leaks that have come out so far, you should be able to update to the newest version over the air. If not, there are some little things you can do to make it work. I'll have a link to the article over on droidlife.com where you can read up on it. But that is all I've got for you guys today. As always, thank you so much for watching. Happy Mother's Day again to all the mothers out there, and I will see you next time.